This is a CBS News special report. I'm Jeff Moore in New York City. We are awaiting the first official briefing on the health of President Donald Trump after he contracted the coronavirus. Last night, the White House medical team determined the president's health was a big enough concern that they took him to Walter Reed Medical Center aboard Marine One. Power remains with the president. Again, they have not transferred power to Vice President Mike Pence. The White House continuing to say the president was simply transferred out of, quote, an abundance of caution and that he'll be there for a few days. Uh, before today's briefing, details have actually been pretty hard to come by regarding the president's condition. We were told he had mild symptoms with a low-grade fever and that he was being treated with an experimental drug cocktail. The president's physician, Sean P. Conley, released a memo Friday afternoon saying the president has received a single 8-gram dose of Regeneron's monoclonal antibody cocktail as a precautionary measure. The news has moved fast following the president's diagnosis, very fast. Overnight, we learned President Trump's former aide, Kellyanne Conway, and his campaign manager, Bill Stepien, have been infected. They joined two members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, First Lady Melania Trump, GOP Chair Ronna McDaniel, and longtime aide Hope Hicks. That has brought huge attention to this White House Rose Garden ceremony held one week ago, nominating Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court, where most of that group appeared where, without masks at the president's announcement. Chip Reid begins our coverage this morning as, again, we await the first official briefing on the president's condition. Uh, Chip, it has been nearly 36 hours since the president announced that he and the first lady tested positive. No official briefings as of yet, but one is coming up right now. What are you expecting? Well, we haven't gotten much information for them, that's for sure. We're going to hear from the president's doctor, Sean Conley. He's going to be speaking in front of that tower here at the Walter Reed Medical Center you see behind me. And the last time we heard from him was late last night in a memo. He said the president's doing well. He did not need suppl supplemental oxygen, which is good news, and that he's taking remdesivir, which is a drug that has shown some good signs in shortening the period that people have COVID-19. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, Jeff, the president is also taking a, an infusion of Regeneron's antibody cocktail. We are certainly, the re, small number of reporters who are over there are going to want to hear more about that. Uh, and I think uh, they are going to simply emphasize the positive here if there is positive to emphasize, not only for political reasons, but for the, the state of international relations and the state of the economy. Certainly the White House, the president, through Conley, will want to emphasize the positive. By the way, the president did tweet last night just once. He said, going well, I think, thank you all, thanks to you all, love, love in all caps, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Jeff? All right, Chip, thanks very much. He also said, I think, uh, in the video message that was sent out immediately before he boarded Marine One and went to Walter Reed, where he said he thinks things are going well, which is interesting to hear from a president who's typically ultra confident about what he says. As John Dickerson noted earlier, it seemed to be a bit of a hedge. He wasn't sure exactly the way this is going to go. Uh, we're going to be joined now by uh, Dr. David Agus, uh, CBS News medical contributor. Um, Dr. Agus, you've actually been in the ward where the president is being treated at Walter Reed. It's Ward 71. Tell me about it. It, you know, it's you know, most hospital rooms are a room with an IV pole and a window. This is a very, very large suite where you can have a staff that can be there to do communications with every medical thing uh, nearby, and it can be converted to an ICU room. So th the notion of being able to work just in case, I mean, obviously, they're being extra cautious with the president. If his oxygenation goes down, which is what happens with this virus, and it can happen rather precipitously at times, you want to have the ability of using supplemental oxygen and potentially even going further with breathing in a very quick time period. And certainly this allows for that. Uh, Dr. Agus, talk about this Regeneron monoclonal uh, antibody cocktail a little bit, if you would, that he's being treated with. Very impressive how you pronounce that. I'm good. It's good. <laughs> um, so um, antibodies are what the body uses proteins to fight off the virus. And we want antibodies that bind to the spike protein and block the virus from getting to the ACE2 receptor or inside the cell. 
Well, Regeneron took two out of a patient and actually cloned them, make large numbers of them, and it's a single shot that lasts for about 21 days. So a shot either in the arm or IV will last for 21 days and give the patient neutralizing antibodies to block the virus from getting into any more cells. Um, we think that these are going to be some of the magic bullets to treat COVID-19. There are at least four different cocktails in development. Um, Regeneron is one of them that announced data several days ago. And that data showed that it reduced the amount of virus in the blood pretty significantly. And it also decreased hospitalization in people who had early the virus, which is exactly what the president had. So certainly an encouraging drug to get, to get. You couple that with remdesivir, which is an IV infusion once a day for five to 10 days while the patient is symptomatic from COVID-19. And that's the state of the art we have now to treat COVID-19. Notable that the president was taken to Walter Reed and the first lady um, remains behind. Is there anything we can read into that? I mean, they, they did release a statement on the first lady's condition saying this morning, that it hadn't worsened. Um, do we assume or not that the president's condition then did worsen and that's why he was transferred? I think you have to. Um, you, you know, this is the, the strangest virus in that some people are totally asymptomatic. Others can end up on a ventilator um, with that same virus. The president has three risks for complications from COVID-19. He's a male, he's overweight, and he's 74 years of age. So that puts him at higher risk, and obviously they take extra precaution because of those risk factors. But I think when you see some symptomatology, particularly some in the lung, that's when you get worried and you want to get aggressive. And I assume that's what happened and why he was transferred to Walter Reed. Uh, Chip Reed, uh, back to you, if we could hear uh, the, uh, the vice president was tested yesterday. He was also tested again this morning. We're being told now that test was negative. What's the vice president's plan? That's right. Well, uh, apparently business as usual to some degree, if you can do that while in quarantine, but he's going to be working and uh, uh, his wife too also tested negative. But keep in mind, as Dr. Agus and our other doctors here at uh, CBS News have made, uh, made us uh, remember over and over again that just because you testify, uh, you, you, just because you test negative today does not mean you're going to test negative tomorrow. You can have the coronavirus and test negative in fact a fairly substantial por proportion of people who do test negative after they've been exposed uh, test negative and later test positive so keep that in mind it doesn't mean the, that they're out of the woods uh, but certainly it is good news for the vice president and his wife that they tested negative again today Jeff Chip it does seem like after a, a fair amount of confusion yesterday there is a little, at least a little bit more information flowing out of the White House both last night and this morning. A little more, but I tell you, it is still uh, surprising how little information is coming out. Uh, I mean, there's a certain responsibility the White House has to let uh, the American people know how their president is doing, uh, and they're not doing a lot of that. Uh, so far, they've kept it very closely held. We'll see if that changes when Dr. Sean Conley talks to us in just a little while. Dr. Agus, you, you mentioned before some of the uh, conditions the president has that uh, age and others that complicate this particular case for him. Can you talk more about that and how it impacts his treatment at Walter Reed right now moving forward? So when we look at data across the country, I mean, so this is in the thousands and thousands of people who've been infected or tested positive with COVID-19, a subset of them get very ill. And when you look, those are people who are male, almost twice as likely, more than twice as likely than women. Those are people that are uh, older. The older you are, 70 to 74 has a significant hospitalization rate, 75 to 80 dramatically higher than that. Um, and people who are overweight also has a significant bearing on the outcome with COVID-19. And so, so the president has three risk factors that put him at higher risk for complication. That being said, anybody can have complications from this. And we've seen it in teenagers. We've seen it in 20 year olds, um, but they're more likely in those. And, you know, just so what was built on, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, the, the, totally accurate on the testing, right, is that when you breathe in 
droplets from this virus, they go into the lung and they could be resident there. And they have to get to a certain level. So when you breathe them out, you can find them in the nose, you can find them in the mouth and elsewhere. And that test, that PCR test turns positive. So there's a period, the incubation period, where you have the virus anywhere from two to 14 days um, to get to enough virus that the test turns positive. So a negative test means just that. You're negative at that moment in time and probably not infectious that moment in time, but doesn't say what's going to happen in 24 hours. Major Garrett is on the phone for us. Major, what are you hearing right now? Well, there are several things that we've gone over this morning that uh, the White House physician must explain to the American public. And, Jeff, you made a mention to Chip Reed that the information is coming out a little bit more frequently. But by any historic standard, this White House is dramatically behind the information curve. In the last 24 hours, the president has been given two different treatments. That's a significant intervention by my layman's point of view. I defer to Dr. Agus, but two things have been done to the President of the United States in response to a positive COVID-19 test. The American public needs to know what the decisions were behind with both of the interventions, what they are seeking to accomplish, what is the current state of the President's health in specifics, and what is the expected reaction of the body in the next 24 to 48 hours. These are not incidental medical matters, and they are very much related to matters of state. The stability of the presidency, the workability of the presidency, the health of the president of the United States, and the future direction of the country. I'm not hyping any of those things. These are central to the information flow that must come from the White House to the American public. And I certainly hope that the briefing that we are now anticipating outside of the Bethesda Naval Medical Center will be extensive and cover a lot of this ground. It would be egregious if Dr. Conley came out and read a statement and walked away. There needs to be extensive questions asked and answered about the underlying condition of the president, where he is now, where they hope to see him in 24 to 48 hours, and why these two interventions were done in the sequence they were done and in combination. I know Dr. Agus has thoughts about the combination of it, but lots of Americans especially Trump supporters who love this president as they probably love no president in their lifetime are desperate for this information. They and, need and want clarity. And, and Major, forgive me if you mentioned this, but never mind uh, answering questions about the timeline of, of when they knew about Hope Hicks' diagnosis and then release it or didn't release it and then held an event on Thursday. Precisely. I mean, all of that stuff also has to be dealt with. And this is, and I thought yesterday was a perfect opportunity for the White House to get some of these basic facts out also bring Dr. Deborah Burks, the Coronavirus Task Force chairwoman, to the podium because early on, March, April, May, she spent a lot of time explaining to the American public why contact tracing is so important and how to do it. This is a moment to teach the entire country about how the process works and why it is vital in the case of a positive test of someone who is of significance and interacts with lots of people to actually play this out for the public to visibly see what contact tracing is, how it works, and most importantly, why it is effective and why it is helpful in identifying places where the virus might spread next and how it spread in the first place. All of this can be seen. The White House can be a prism by which to evaluate all of these underlying facts if it wants to. And as I said at the top, this White House on that measurement is dreadfully behind the information curve. So, you, so you've got to do contact tracing not only on the Rose Garden ceremony, but also for the debate now, because what, 12 staffers from the debate in Cleveland have tested positive? 12 people who are around the debate itself. I'm not exactly sure within which party they were or if they were part of the uh, arrangement for the Presidential Commission on Debates. But to your point, Jeff, yes, it has to be done there. And not only that, but at the fundraiser in Bedminster on Thursday, there has to be an elaborate process of contact tracing and it needs to be done not privately i'm not saying you ex expose everyone to everything but the public needs to be educated on this but that's secondary to where the president's condition is now why these two interventions were done how the decision process was put forward to make those interventions real and available to the president and then used on the president and then what the nation should be looking for as the doctors are looking for in the next 24 to 48 hours to gauge whether or not they're successful. And I would be very interested to know from Dr. Agus's perspective, 
in general, not because he's not treating the president, but in general, what kind of things would physicians, having engaged in these two different interventions, would hope to see in the next 24 to 48 hours? Because the country needs to know that. That fundraiser you mentioned on Thursday, by the way, was 60 people, none of whom were wearing face coverings, uh, a cocktail uh, fundraiser donor party, which took place uh, Thursday evening. Dr. Agus, what is the impact of the, of the, the drug cocktails and the, and the treatment regimen that the president is on right now? What is the impact on the body and the brain? So right now, remdesivir um, and, and the, the antibody cocktail from Regenera, neither one of them affect the brain or cognitive function at all. Dexamethasone or Decadron, which would be used if the uh, president had more lung uh, uh, issues. If he started to get more short of breath, they would put him on Dexamethasone or Decadron, which is a steroid, and it could cause manic behavior and not appropriate thinking. He's on famotidine, which is a drug that blocks acid in the stomach. Pepsid is the generic name for it. And it's commonly used to protect the stomach in case someone goes on a, a steroid like dexamethasone. So the other side effect of that is the stomach, which he's being protected for now. Um, but certainly, if he goes on dexamethasone, that does affect how he would approach problems, how he would think, and how his cognitive function would be, classically causing manic-like behavior. So there's no, there's no one way that, that uh, the coronavirus, can, it, it affects different people in different ways. Can you talk about what stage so, you, you believe the president is at here and, and what happens next? I mean, the White House is saying it's, it might be a few days. We don't know exactly how long it might be. So classically, this virus affects the lung. In asymptomatic people, if you did a CAT scan, on a significant percentage of them with no symptoms at all, you could see pockets of inflammation in the lung. As you get older, and actually as you're larger, you don't use your lung as well. And so even smaller amounts of inflammation in the lung can get you symptomatic. What we worry about is that if that inflammation in the lung progresses and you get progressive shortness of breath. With this virus, everybody who ends up on a ventilator starts with mild symptoms. So those mild symptoms can slowly get better, or if you don't make the appropriate immune response and make an aggressive immune response called a cytokine storm, they can get dramatically worse and cause leakiness in the lung. Cytokine storm is when the, uh, uh, the immune cells in the body get overactivated and they cause fluid to leak in the lung. And fluid basically blocks oxygen absorption in the lung, so it makes it harder and harder to breathe. And we have to use a ventilator and actually put pressure in the lung to get oxygen to the blood. And the hope is that turns around in time, which it seems to. Early in the disease, when you went on a ventilator, your chance of getting off was 20 to 25 percent. Now that number is close to 80 percent of people do get off the ventilator and are able to survive. So dramatically improvement in how we ventilate patients and how we care for them. But what we're worried about is the next few days, is that what is the course going to be? Some patients get better and then there's kind of a second thing where they start to get worse and worse and worse. So you have to follow it for a period now of probably seven to ten days to know the outcome. And obviously he's being closely monitored. They're gonna have something on his finger called a pulse oximeter. And we'll be looking at real time of the oxygenation in his blood. And we want that number to be over 95%. So today, is the doctor gonna tell us what the pulse oximeter of the lung is? Is, it gonna, is he going to tell us what happened when they scan the lungs? How much involvement is there of the lungs? Is he going to tell us about the blood pressure of the, uh, uh, of the president, if that's affected? Um, if he's still having a fever without Tylenol or other medicines to lower it. All of those are critical for us to understand the severity and what the course could be to this virus. If you are just joining us, we're awaiting an update uh, on the president's condition as he uh, wakes up this morning at Walter Reed following his coronavirus uh, diagnosis late Thursday night, early Friday morning. The White House says all of President Trump's campaign events have either been canceled or moved online as he undergoes treatment right now. Ed O'Keefe joins us. Uh, Ed, um, it changes the campaign completely on both sides. But for now, um, the Biden campaign is suspending negative ads. I know it's not a full stop, so you might still see some negative ads on TV this weekend. But talk about the Biden campaign's thinking right now. As far as we know, Jeff, good to see you. We, uh, you know, they are they are proceeding as scheduled. Uh, Dr. Jill Biden, the candidate's wife, is scheduled to campaign today in Minnesota. Senator Kamala Harris, his running mate, is scheduled to make an appearance in Salt Lake City in just a little bit. She went there after campaign events in Nevada yesterday and now plans to stay there 
until the debate later this week. Uh, getting there a little earlier, we believe, than originally planned uh, as a precaution. Uh, and Biden himself currently is scheduled to campaign in South Florida on Monday. And as of right now, at least, there is no plan to change that. On, on the other side, they announced this morning, the Trump campaign did, that Vice President Pence is going forward with a campaign stop Thursday in Arizona, the day after the debate. Might be some questions there about whether he should be doing that, perhaps, if he has more significant constitutional responsibilities by Thursday. We don't want to uh, speculate too much about that, but that has to be on the minds of people who are involved with his planning. Uh, but without the vice president, there really is nobody out there uh, in the Trump campaign, uh, certainly nobody on the ticket, uh, that could be out there talking to voters. And that has been a big part of their strategy throughout the pandemic, to actually hold big rallies, whether they're indoor or outdoor. Uh, it is their M.O. And, and so the vice president has been holding more modest events. He was in Iowa this past week, and now apparently he will go to Arizona, despite the fact that, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot more interest and concern around him as the president remains hospitalized. And as you said, negative advertising from the Biden campaign, of which there is plenty in battleground states, is being pulled off the air and offline this weekend. You may still see some of it, but their intent for now, at least, is to remove it. Um, but, you know, other than that, there hasn't been too much of a change in strategy on the Biden side, at least, as I think they wait to see uh, the, the condition of the president and, and exactly what happens. To Nancy Cordes now. Uh, Nancy, as they continue to contact Trace here and test following the Rose Garden event and other events for people that may have been close to uh, the president in the past week or so, three senators have tested positive so far. Um, other members of Congress, um, including up on the screen right now, you see some of the other advisors or former advisors of the president who now uh, have tested positive, including Kellyanne Conway, uh, Hope Hicks, uh, whose diagnosis uh, triggered all of this. Nancy, what, what do we know about who else is being tested right now or who's testing positive? Well, so far, two Republican senators, you showed them on the screen, who were at that Rose Garden event have tested positive. Senator Mike Lee of Utah, who at first had what he thought were uh, allergy-type symptoms, then he tested positive, uh, and Tom Tillis of North Carolina. Uh, and now there's a third Republican senator who has announced that he has tested positive as well. That's Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. He was not at the White House on Saturday, but he did sit right next to Senator Lee at a committee meeting on Thursday. That is the day that Senator Lee started having symptoms. So it's not difficult to draw a line there and figure out exactly where Senator John Johnson might have uh, contracted the virus. So all three of them are now in isolation, some here in D.C., some in their home states. And uh, this really sort of uh, throws the Senate into a bit of chaos because we do have the confirmation hearings for Amy Coney Barrett, the president's nominee for Supreme Court justice, coming up in just a week and a half. Senators Lee and Tillis are on the Judiciary Committee that will hold those hearings. For now, Senate Republican leaders say they are moving ahead with the schedule as planned. But it is hard to see how they don't make some kind of accommodation here with several of their members either testing positive or falling ill. And, of course, Democrats who don't want to see Coney Barrett confirmed are uh, uh, making a lot of noise and arguing that it would be irresponsible to bring the Senate back and to hold these hearings when we still don't know just how widespread uh, this virus will become. They're still waiting to see if others test positive as well. Nancy, never mind negotiations over the next coronavirus relief bill. Absolutely. And those actually do continue this weekend. Speaker Pelosi is speaking with Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. Uh, we understand that they have begun to make some progress. They are narrowing the gap. They're still hopeful that they will be able to come up with some kind of plan for the uh, millions of Americans. You know, get outside of Washington, get outside of that Rose Garden. There are millions of Americans who are still hurting either because they contracted the virus or because their children can't go to school or because they have lost their jobs and they need help. And it's been more than two months now that those Americans who have lost their jobs have been going out without that $600 a week federal unemployment benefit. So that is part of the negotiations, maybe not the full 600, maybe something more like $500 a week, but still a big increase. Another uh, round of $1,200 stimulus checks could be in the offing, more money for schools, for testing, for state and local governments that have been 
hit so hard by this pandemic. So, uh, you know, it is a good sign that those talks are continuing, and, and obviously lawmakers from both sides would love to be able to tell their constituents right before an election that they did something that put cash in their pockets. Okay, we're going to go back to Chip Reed here, who's at uh, Walter Reed, as uh, we again wait this, await this briefing on the president's condition, the first one we've uh, received since he was admitted last evening around 6.30. Chip, uh, Walter Reed has a, a long history of treating presidents. It certainly does, but let me m mention one other point before I get to that, and that is that uh, from the people we've been talking to over the last several minutes, especially Dr. Eggis and Major Garrett, we've heard a slew of questions uh, that the press will have and that the American people have to ask Dr. Sean Conley, but the big question right now is, is he even going to take questions or is he simply going to read a statement and then go back inside? Because I'm sure there are some people in this White House who don't want him out there fielding a whole bunch of questions about how the president's breathing and uh, what his... Uh, uh, what his heart rate is and everything else uh, they want him to do the statement keep control of the situation and go back in we'll see who prevails uh, in that but on the issue of history presidents have been coming here uh, since 1940 when FDR Franklin Delano Roosevelt dedicated this tower behind me in fact he selected the location uh, pretty much every president has a number of them also went to the uh, Walter Reed Army Hospital that used to be in Washington, D.C. in 2011. The Army Hospital uh, and the Bethesda Naval Hospital combined into one here in Bethesda, and that's what you have now. And that this hospital treats members of all the different services, not just the Army and the Navy, also the Air Force and, of course, the Marines uh, within, within, the, uh, within the Navy. Not sure about the Coast Guard. We'll have to look into that, but I wouldn't be surprised if they have access here do. It really is an extraordinary uh, medical complex. And right here is NIH across the street from each other. Two of the premier medical facilities in this country and indeed in the world right here. It's kind of ground zero for uh, medical care, especially over there for military medical care and presidential medical care. Jeff. And you mentioned that, it's that special unit, uh, Ward 71, that uh, Dr. Igus was speaking about before, which is designed especially for the president, which includes uh, the medical equipment, office space, other places. The, the White House does say at this time that the president does remain fully in charge as he is treated and as we await this, um, this briefing on his condition outside Walter Reed from his, we're expecting to hear from the president's physician, Sean Conley, Sean P. Conley. The question is whether he will take questions or not or just read a statement about what is happening with the president right now. We know the president, again, is receiving a, a dose of Regeneron's uh, monoclonal antibody cocktail as a precautionary measure along with a few other drugs at this moment to try to ward off, there you see on your screen right now, to ward off uh, this disease that he was diagnosed with late on Thursday night. Um, I want to check back in with Dr. Agus if we can, if we have him. Um, and doctor, can you talk more about, um, about the timing here and the incubation period? Because there's so many questions right now about what happened at the Rose Garden, about then the diagnosis of Hope Hicks, about the event that took place then on Thursday, and the contact tracing that's taking place. There's a whole lot going on. Um, how far back do they have to go? So the state-of-the-art test we have now is called a PCR test. It amplifies the RNA of the virus, but you need a certain amount in your mouth or your nose, which is what they swab, in order for that test to be positive. So many times, if you speak to me, Jeff, and you're positive, I inhale those uh, droplets, and they're in my lung. After they grow, and there's a significant number of them, I start to exhale them, and you can measure them in my nasal swab in my mouth. That takes anywhere from 2 to 14 days, depending really on how much virus you've been exposed to. So contact tracing, we classically go back two to three days before symptomatology. This is one of the few viruses, and it's pretty dastardly about this virus, is that if you go back two to three days, you are infectious before you're symptomatic. Almost every other virus, the common cold, the flu, you are infectious when you're symptomatic. Here it's before you're symptomatic. 
So we go back, if, if the president was symptomatic yesterday, we go back three days and we say, who was he exposed to in those three days to have real interactions without a mask, without a, a social distancing, and those people need to be put on isolation and those people need to be tested for a period of up to 14 days, not just once, but up to 14 days. That's what contact tracing involves. Contact tracing can be done through a technology where on your cell phone it can know when other cell phones are near you and who they are, or it can be done in the case of the president where they're basically reviewing video and saying who did he talk to, how long, were they close, were they wearing a mask, etc. Those people are contacted and told, here are the CDC guidelines for staying indoors, not going out, not interacting with anybody, and the testing required of you. But there's a there's a the, the big question though is the re reliability of the testing. You mentioned the gold standard, the PCR. I mean, there's also the rapid tests, which are far less reliable. Yeah, so there, 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 there are three buckets of tests. There's what's called the antigen test, and that was the test that was, that was announced a week or two ago, uh, or maybe longer. I have no sense of timing during all this uh, <laughs> pandemic. But that's the card where they look and say, do you have virus or not? That actually looks for the presence of the virus. It doesn't amplify it. It is meant for people who are symptomatic, that is, have very high viral loads. Then there's the PCR, which is the most sensitive. And then in the middle are some of these rapid tests. Many of the tests said, we have a sensitivity of 95%. Well, it depends on who you test. So if they take 30 people with really high viral loads, they're going to have a great sensitivity. If they take people with very low viral loads, they're not. And right now, there's no standards on how you report it. So some of the statistics of the testing can be misleading. Okay, doctor, thanks. Ed O'Keefe, oh, by the way, it's one month until the election, 31 days now. Uh, what are we hearing about the campaign surrogates? He's, he's off the campaign trail. What are we hearing about campaign surrogates right now? Sure. Well, his running mate, Mike Pence, is scheduled to appear at a campaign rally this Thursday, the day after the vice presidential debate in Salt Lake City. But the campaign said last night, Jeff, that all events with family members will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and will make any relevant announcements in the coming days. But for now, they're temporarily postponed. Prominent surrogates include, of course, the first daughter, uh, Ivanka Trump, his sons, Eric and Don Jr., uh, his, his daughter-in-law um, as well, and, uh, and then Pence, who has been holding modest, more modest events all through the summer uh, up until this past week. But Pence, for the next few days, obviously has to prepare for this vice presidential debate and also, you know, frankly, has to be uh, in close touch with the president's team. Uh, just in case. And we don't say that lightly. We don't say that uh, crassly. It's just reality that, that, that at this time, uh, you know, the vice president becomes a much bigger factor in, in all things related to, to the government. And so the campaign, in essence, uh, is in this unprecedented state of suspension with, as you said, 31 days to go and millions of Americans already voting. Uh, and, and it's just incredible, Jeff, that, you know, you layer that on top of a push to get a Supreme Court justice seated before the election, or at least in the coming weeks, uh, on top of the fact that, you know, this pandemic continues, that there's incredible economic uncertainty across the country, and you've got a, a host of issues that this country has never dealt with, let alone simultaneously. But uh, from a political perspective, it forces everyone in campaign politics to stop and wonder, what is appropriate right now? What can we do? What should we do? For example, in the Biden campaign, as we await word on what more they may do or change about their strategy, they were supposed to, just this weekend, begin deploying staff and volunteers to go knock on doors. A very basic and common thing that had not been done by them at all over the course of the pandemic so far, but they'd reached a point where they thought now public health and safety was okay and that they should start doing it. Well, should they? Those are the conversations now that you know are happening, not only in the two presidential campaigns, but in the handful of Senate races across the country that are the most competitive and critical, in congressional races, uh, and in all other sorts of contests. Because we wait here uh, hoping that the White House will tell us in a little bit, or at least the, the doctor that is treating the president, how he is and what the nation and the world can expect regarding his prognosis in the coming days. With the caveat, as Dr. Regis so ably points out, that this thing can, can, can affect people in all sorts of different ways. And so uh, it's an incredibly uh, trying and frustrating moment, uh, but one in which I think we may get to a point where campaign politics are just gonna have to slide off for a little bit, um, and, and people will just make their decision as need be. It's just incredible, Jeff. I mean, people are getting ballots in the mail right now. 
They may be going to early voting sites or may have planned to today. Uh, either way, the election's in 31 days. And there's still three debates scheduled. Uh, we know, for example, in Salt Lake City, where the vice presidential debate is set to be held, they're likely going to have to find a bigger table or at least make arrangements to keep the vice president and Senator Harris further apart from each other than they were already planning to be and keep the moderator at a, at a safer distance. This was supposed to be a seated debate where they all just sat together at a table. That's usually a pretty really intimate and tight shot. Well, they're going to have to figure out how to shoot that a little differently. And then there's questions of why not just hold this debate in Washington without an audience? Why does it have to be in Salt Lake City? And what steps is that commission that held a debate this past week in Cleveland taking to ensure, as they claimed they were doing in Cleveland, that everyone participating and everyone there in person is being taken safe. It, it, just a, a bucket load of unanswered questions right now. And there's still three months left in 2020. Ed O'Keefe, thanks. Uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Agus and the effects or the lingering effects of, of, of COVID and the coronavirus. Um, once you get past the worst, how long, how long do the effects typically last, doctor? So the, the dominant side effects classically can anywhere last from 7 to 14 days. But I will tell you that having taken care of a lot of patients with coronavirus, the one thing they all talk about is profound fatigue. And that this is a fatigue unlike other fatigue where some of the most functional people I know that were running companies can barely get out of bed. Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the UK, described the same, where it is very, very difficult uh, for his body to do what he wants it to do. Um, so fatigue is a major issue we have to ask about. Dr. Regis, with apologies for interrupting you here, we're about to get a briefing on the president's condition, our first. This is uh, Sean Conley, the president's physician. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, Dr. Sean Conley, physician to the president. Uh, this morning, I'd like to start by uh, first sharing that the president and first family, first lady, extremely grateful for the enormous outpouring of support and prayers that the whole world and uh, country have been providing and sharing. I'd like to thank Colonel Andrew Barr and all the medical and support staff here at Walter Reed for their tireless efforts providing everything and anything the medical team, the president, and I could need. This morning, the president is doing very well. Behind me are some of the members of uh, the president's medical team, uh, whom I'd like to introduce. Uh, Dr. Sean Dooley, pulmonary critical care. Dr. Brian Garibaldi, pulmonary critical care. Dr. Robert Browning, pulmonary critical care. Dr. Jason Blaylock, infectious disease. Dr. Wes Campbell, infectious disease. Dr. John Hodgson, anesthesia. Major Kurt Klein, Army nurse. Commander Megan Nasworthy, Navy nurse. Lieutenant Juliana Lev Levopa, Navy nurse. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander John Shea, clinical pharmacist. And not present with us are Lieutenant Beth Carter, Lieutenant Maureen Meehan, both Navy nurses, and Dr. Jesse Schoenow, director of our executive medicine program. As reported yesterday, consultation with this group, I recommended we bring the president up to Walter Reed as a precautionary me measure to provide state-of-the-art monitoring and any care that he may need. Just 72 hours into the diagnosis now, the first week of COVID, and in particular days 7 to 10 are the most critical in determining the likely course of this illness. At this time, the team and I are extremely happy with the progress the president has made. Thursday, he had a mild cough and some nasal congestion and fatigue, all of which are now resolving and improving. At this time, I'd like to bring up Dr. Dooley to discuss some of the specifics of the president's care. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sean Dooley, as uh, Dr. Conley mentioned. I'll start off by uh, mentioning what, a, what an incredible, uh, how incredibly proud I am of our medical team assembled behind me. Uh, and the honor it's been to care for the, the president over these last uh, 24 hours here at Walter Reed. He's receiving outstanding multidisciplinary care, uh, the state of the science uh, for coronavirus infection. We are monitoring him very closely uh, for any evidence of complications from either the coronavirus illness or the therapies that we are prescribing to uh, make him better. 
We have monitored his cardiac function, uh, his kidney function, his liver function, all of those are normal. And the president this morning is not on oxygen, uh, not having difficulty breathing or walking around uh, the White House medical unit upstairs. He's in exceptionally good spirits. And in fact, uh, as we were completing our multidisciplinary rounds this morning, uh, the quote he, he left us with was, I feel like I could walk out of here today. And, and that was a very encouraging comment from the president. Moving forward, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Garibaldi, who will talk about some of our therapeutics and the plan for uh, plan of care for today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dooley, and I'd like to echo the sentiment from the entire team, what an a honor and a privilege it is to be part of this multidisciplinary unit to care for the president. Um, about 48 hours ago, the president received uh, a special antibody therapy directed against the coronavirus, and we're working very closely with the company to monitor him uh, in terms of uh, that outcome. Um, yesterday evening, he received his first dose of IV remdesivir, and our plan is to continue a five-day treatment course for remdesivir. And the big plan for today, since he's in such great spirits and doing well, is to encourage him to eat, to drink, to stay hydrated, to be up out of bed, and to be working and doing the thing, things that he needs to do uh, to get well. Um, and I'll refer Dr. Connolly to any, any questions. Thanks, Brian. It's important to note the president's been fever-free for over 24 hours. Uh, we remain cautiously optimistic, um, but he's doing great. Um, with that, oh, one other note. It should be clear that uh, he's got plenty of work to get done from the chief of staff, and he's doing it. Um, with that, if there's a couple questions about the president's health uh, in the last couple days. Sir, can you tell us the president's uh, oxygen saturation level, please? Yeah, so the, the last uh, saturation that we had up walking around, he was uh, about 96%. He has not received any supplemental oxygen? He's not on oxygen right now, that's right. He has not received any at all? He's he's not needed any, but any uh, this morning, today at all. That's right. Do no, he's... Have, do you have an estimated date when he might be discharged? Uh, well, I don't want to put a hard date on that. Um, he's doing so well, but the, the, with a known course of the illness, Day seven to 10, we get really concerned about the inflammatory phase, phase two. Um, given that we provided some of these uh, uh, advanced therapies so early in the course, a little bit earlier than, than most of the patients we know and follow, um, it's hard to tell where he is uh, on that course. And so uh, every day we're evaluating, does he need to be here? Uh, what does he need? Uh, and where is he going? Do you see as a probability that he will need supplemental oxygen going forward? Uh, I don't want to put a uh, percentage on that, but, but right now all indicators are that, uh, uh, that he'll remain off of oxygen uh, going forward. And in terms of like blood clots, pneumonia, bacterial infection, what do you see as the risk on that front? Uh, well, we know that all of them are risks associated with this condition. Um, uh, he is receiving all of the uh, standard of care and beyond uh, per routine you know, international COVID protocols. Um, so uh, we're monitoring for all of that, um, but at the moment, there's no cause for concern. You said he was, he's fever-free now. What was his fever when he had one, sir? Uh, I'd rather not give any specific numbers, but he, but he did have a fever uh, Thursday into Friday, and since Friday morning, he's had none. Okay. And what was the date? On top of the other antibodies. I'm sorry? Why remdesivir on top of the antibodies? Uh, so remdesivir works a little bit differently than the antibodies. We're maximizing uh, all aspects of his care, uh, attacking uh, this virus, you know, a multi-pronged uh, approach. Uh, as the president, uh, I didn't want to hold anything back. If there was any possibility that it would add value to his care and expedite his return, um, I wanted to take it. And uh, the team agreed. And that's what we proceeded. Doctor, what was the date of the president's last negative test? Uh, I'm not going to get into all the testing going back, um, but but he and all the staff routine uh, routinely uh, are tested, um, and so. Doctor, what is the uh, PPE protocol for uh, President Trump receiving visitors and uh, doctors? It's the same as any hospital has. Um, we have an area that's uh, that clean that you, you put your equipment on, and then beyond that, uh, everybody is fully gowned up, masks, gloves. Um, we're protecting ourselves and him. 
Has he received, have you done a screen? Has there been any sign of any lung damage whatsoever? We are we are following all of that. We do daily ultrasounds. We do daily lab work. The team is tracking all of that. Has there been Has any sign experience? of damage? Sir? I'm not going to go into specifics on what the findings of can, any can of that are. Can we just put you down on one thing? Has he ever been on supplemental oxygen? He. Right now, he is not on I oxygen. You, I know you keep saying right, right now, but should we read into the fact that he had been previously? Yesterday and today, he was not on oxygen. So he has not been on it during this his COVID treatment? He's, he's not on oxygen right now. <laughs> has hydroxychloroquine been considered as a viable treatment option for the president? Uh, we discussed it. He asked about it. Uh, he's not on it now. And, and Doctor, what uh, symptoms? Has he also experienced difficulty breathing? No. No, he has not. Never did. He had a little cough. He had the fever. More than anything, he's felt run down. Who is handling contact tracing? Is that the White House or CDC? The uh, the White House uh, uh, White House Medical Unit, in conjunction with uh, you know in collaboration with CDC and local, state, and health departments, are are conducting all contact tracing per CDC guidelines. When was the positive diagnosis made? Uh, you said 72 hours. That would put that Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, so Thursday afternoon, uh, following. Uh, uh, following the news of a close contact is when we, we repeated testing um, and given kind of clinical indications at a little bit more concern and that's when that late that night uh, we got the PCR confirmation that uh, that he was. Is there any clarity on how he became infected? Uh, not going to go into that. Um, as far as his care, it's, it's irrelevant. Or when he became infected? Yeah, uh, we're not going to go into that. Uh, we're just tracking his uh, clinical course and providing the best care we can. Will President Trump have to stay at Walter Reed to get uh, the five-day remedial cure treatment? Um, we've discussed that right now. Uh, if he needs all five days, uh, that will likely be the course. Um, but again, every day we're reviewing with the team uh, his needs for being here. And, uh, and it, as soon as he gets to the point where uh, it's not a requirement, he may still need some care, but if we can provide that downtown at the house, um, then, then we will transition at that point, as long as it's uh, safe and appropriate and the team agrees. In addition to his weight, does he have any other risk factors that make him more at risk for sort of a severe case? Well, uh, not particularly. I mean, he's, he's 74, he's male, um, and he is slightly overweight. Um, other than that, he's very healthy. Uh, his cholesterol is great, his blood pressure is great, he's not on medication for that. Um, he's up and active. You saw the, uh, his activity, the days leading up to, the long hours and everything else. You know, he's, he's able to handle it. Can you provide other vitals like heart rate, blood pressure, and temperature? Um, so his, his heart rate is in the uh, 70s to 80s. Uh, his blood pressure has remained where it's, where it's historically been during our physicals. Uh, you know, 110 to 120s, his stop, he's great. It's never budged. I've uh, had no concerns there. So why was the decision made to transfer him here? Because he's the President of the United States. And obviously, if doctors have found that the prone position is helpful for COVID, has he been in that at all? No, we actually, he asked about that. He did, uh, Thursday into Friday. Um, he's been briefed by the task force and all the scientists for months. And he brought that up, you know, as we were discussing his cough. And at that time, his oxygen levels were okay. We didn't feel like we needed to do it. We came up here, we discussed it with the team as well. Um, we consider all options, but he has not needed any of that. Why wasn't the first lady admitted as well? Uh, the first lady's doing great. Thanks for asking. Uh, she has no indication for hospitalization, advanced therapy. She's convalescing at home. Uh, thank you. I'm going to try to pin you down one more time. I know you said there's no oxygen. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. Is that, yeah he's is that not he on oxygen but did he uh, today. Any, did he receive and, any on Thursday? And he's, what's today, Saturday? Today's Saturday. Uh, no, no, Thursday. Okay, so no Thursday, we, no Friday, no Saturday. That's fine. So that, that was why we were confused. Thursday, no oxygen, none at this moment. Yeah, and yesterday with the team, uh, while, while we were all here, he was not on oxygen. So has the president actually been admitted as a patient to this hospital? The president is a patient at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. <laughs> is he on any steroids? Yes. Press, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, there you have it, the first briefing on the president's condition following his admittance to Walter Reed Medical Center for treatment of the coronavirus after his diagnosis on Thursday. A couple highlights from that briefing and the president's physician, Sean Conley. He said the president is not currently 
on oxygen, but it sounds like there's a little bit of confusion about whether he, or not he may have been. It sounds like he may have been yesterday. Uh, Conley said the president has been fever-free now for over 24 hours, um, and that uh, the president said today, quote, I feel like I could walk out of here right now. Um, I'm going to bring in Dr. Agus, uh, Dr. David Agus, for his thoughts. Again, doctor, you've been inside that ward, Ward 71, at Walter Reed, where presidents are treated. Mm -hmm. His oxygen saturation level is 96 percent. What does that mean? Well, at the moment, his oxygen is very well, um, and I think that's very good. And so the question, obviously, and it certainly looks like he was on oxygen at some point, but that avoiding it. You know, what really came to me in this is that, first of all, there are two sets of doctors. If you notice the green scrubs and the blue scrubs, the people wearing the blue were from Johns Hopkins Hospital, and the people wearing the green were from Walter Reed. In fact, the second doctor who was introduced is a pulmonary doctor who I know from Johns Hopkins. So it's interesting, they brought in experts from other areas to help with the care. Um, you know, certainly uh, what was described was very card guarded and cautious words, especially about the oxygen and the president. And we know nothing about the steroids. We know nothing about the imaging of the lung, which is critical. Is, is there involvement in the lung and how much? Cardiac function, liver function, kidney function, Dr. Conley said, all good. What do they continue to test and, and look for today? Every day they're doing blood tests to look at the kidney and the liver and make sure that none of the medicines, because some of them are experimental, haven't interfered with those organs. And remember, he did get a drug that has not received FDA approval or EUA, that is the Regeneron monoclonal antibody cocktail. And so we have to monitor closely because there's not a lot of patients who've received it and make sure there are no side effects, although I doubt there will be. Um, they're going to image his lungs. And they, for some reason, Conley said, we're doing ultrasound on the lungs regularly. That made no sense. You know, when you do ultrasound, they're probably checking the legs for blood clots, which can happen with this virus. And this virus can affect blood vessels, so we look closely with ultrasound in the legs. And I'm sure that's what he meant. Um, but imaging the lungs is critical. It's how much involvement is there? Because that can give you a, a guess of what's going to happen. If there's more and more involvement, you know he's going to need oxygen soon and the disease is progressing. We have to pay really close attention. So that was obviously missed and not discussed, as was, was he on oxygen and why was he on oxygen at some point? Yeah, there was an interesting question about the, uh, the prone position as well. Uh, and it was interesting to note because the president's physician said that the president actually asked about that. Um, can you talk about that a little bit, doctor? What we know is that in the prone position, you can aerate your lungs better. And so the time to requiring ventilation or other oxygen support is longer because you can aerate them better. People who are larger, like the president, sometimes have somewhat restrictive capacity to aerate their whole lungs. Um, and so putting a patient in the prone position can buy time. And you're buying time for your immune system to kick in. You're buying time for the drugs to kick in and work. Um, so it is a methodology that we've been using routinely. And obviously, the president heard that in his briefings and asked about it, which is, you know, obviously smart um, that he did that. And the doctors, I'm sure, would have been aware of it on their own. Okay, Dr. Regis, thanks very much. I want to turn to Chip Reed now, who's outside Walter Reed. Uh, Chip, uh, answers and, and questions were taken by the president's personal physician, but not an answer about whether, officially, about whether the president was on oxygen yesterday, although it certainly sounds like he was. Yeah, that was certainly uh, one of the key issues here because uh, it sure sounded like he was trying to avoid answer, answering that question again and again. Uh, he was asked about oxygen, and he said he's not on oxygen right now. He's not on o he was not on oxygen at particular points in time. But why would he not have simply said he has not been on oxygen at all? But to me, one of the really interesting questions here, too, is uh, the question of discharge. Um, I mean, the fact that we're out here, this is, there is a mob of press here. Uh, a growing number of pro-Trump uh, supporters uh, on the other side of the street. It's a fairly dangerous situation. Six-lane highway here. Uh, it's uh, uh, yesterday uh, there was almost a pedestrian run over here that I saw. Uh, it's, uh, it's the kind of situation that you really don't want to continue for too long. Perhaps they'll move us in there. I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, but, uh, but it's it, unclear 
completely unclear. It's a five-day course, they said, of Remdesivir. Uh, and it, it, they were very clear that the president wants to get out of here, said he could felt, feels like he could get out of here today. Uh, but uh, they said they evaluated every day. But how long is he going to be here? They really gave us no indication of that, uh, despite the president's feeling that he could walk out of here today. Chip, thanks for, Chip thank you very much. Um, uh, we should mention, we just got this news that Chris Christie, a former governor of New Jersey, has tested positive for COVID. Christie was at the Rose Garden ceremony, the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. He also uh, was personally preparing the president, among others, for this debate. So he says he is positive, according to this tweet. Major Garrett, what answers did you get at this briefing from Sean Conley, and which ones did you not get? Well, Dr. David Agus and Chip Reed have gone over the ones that are allowing us to get a better insight into this matter. One answer struck me because I don't think the doctor would, on second thought, give that answer again, which is to say when the president contracted con the president coronavirus and from whom or where is irrelevant. No, it's not. It's deeply relevant, not only to the president's health, but the, the time he has been exposed to this and those around him who might now be vulnerable. And with Chris Christie's confirmation that he has tested positive, that's another example of those in the president's inner circle, whether involved in preparation for the first presidential debate or any other action, interaction with the president, might find themselves testing positive for this virus. But we did learn more. We learned that the president's heart rate and blood pressure are in their normal zones. That's helpful. We didn't get a sense of what things really looked like Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I have a sense from this White House and knowing President Trump as I do, they wanted to wait until there was something net positive they could report. Not net um, conclusive, because it's not, and not net giving you all information about the entire trajectory of what's gone on, but where we are now and that it sounds positive. It didn't sound as if they wanted to go into very much detail about Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, other than when they were pressed to do so. That suggests that there was some measure of uncertainty or questions about how this would go, and clearly with two interventions, this uh, cocktail of measures taken and the remdesivir suggest things had to get advanced and move quickly to get the president where he is now. Much more to be learned as days go forward. All right. All right, Major Gary, thanks very much. To recap now, White House Dr. Sean Conley updating the nation. The doctor saying the president is receiving a five-day treatment with remdesivir, but that he cannot give a timetable for release from the hospital. Doctors say that uh, the president is in exceptionally good spirits, that he has been fever-free for 24 hours and not having difficulty breathing now, though they danced around the question of if the president has been on supplemental oxygen before. We're also hearing the First Lady is continuing to do well, and she will remain at the White House. That will do it for this special report. Our coverage of the President Trump's hospitalization will continue in the local news on this CBS station and on our 24-hour streaming news service, CBSN. Again, it's been a CBS News special report. I'm Jeff Moore, CBS News in New York. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com.